Hey, everybody. Welcome to our group. Today, we're going to be talking about data architecture. Hey, everyone. Hi, Nicole. Okay, so we'll jump into the topic now, data architecture. But prior to that, let me give a little bit of background about myself. So I'm Mark Knudl. I'm out of Munich, Germany. I've been doing data for the past 17 years, over almost two decades now. Spent first decade actually more into data analytics, doing dashboarding, solutioning, KPIs, and so forth. But more on the solution and analytics end, in the past seven years, I've been in data governance and got certified through the help also of data strategy pros back in 2022 for the CDMP. Then from there, connected with Nicole and became part of her team, helping others get certified and helping other data practitioners have a community resource, a friendly resource for you to ask your questions and for you to be guided either if you want to be passing the CDMP or you want also some guidance around initiating a data program or you're part of it or you want to start introducing it in your company. So there are different kinds of flavors of practitioners that we try to help out. As I mentioned, we are data strategy professionals. We have a LinkedIn group, so feel free to join that. We post our events there. There are a lot of forums, also discussions happening. We discuss particular chapters, but there's also a CDMP study group, which is on Facebook as well. This is more focused on really the CDMP exam or just getting certified. But again, some conversations go back and forth. So sometimes we also discuss general topics around data governance. Then, of course, we have the event that we're on, which is the discussion group. So the intent here has evolved over the years, but the intent here is that we read the chapter on our own and then come to the discussion groups to bring our questions and use it as a community platform where you can exchange ideas. Maybe somebody misunderstood a statement or has a different interpretation and you want to get that cleared. Just to help you prepare for your exam, we also share tips and tricks for the exam. So if you have any questions generally around the CDMP exam that name offers, feel free to also ask it. It doesn't only have to be about the chapter. It can also be about the general things around the exam itself or on certification. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick. We just now added a study group specifically on LinkedIn because we heard from a lot of people that, like me, they hate Facebook and they think LinkedIn is more professional, which obviously it is. So it makes sense to have a CDMP study group on that channel as well. So we have added to the platform of LinkedIn a community for CDMP study specifically. So please do join us there. We're going to try to increasingly bring over some of the best content that we've used on Facebook in the past couple of years. Awesome. That's great news, actually, because I also don't like Facebook. I just created a profile for the sake of having that discussion group. We prepared some summary points for the chapter, so we can go through that. As soon as you have anything on your mind, please feel free to interrupt the session and post your question either on chat or come off mute. The data architecture chapter four is 6% of the exam. It's important chapter to learn because it sets the foundation of what Peter Aiken calls his data framework in which the data management, the DEMBOK body of knowledge has adopted. You can interpret it as the foundational chapters that are here at the bottom of the pyramid are actually the ones that you need to be familiar with to pass the exam. We covered data governance earlier in the year in the discussion group already. And now we're going into the next part of the pyramid, data architecture, data quality, and metadata. I really like this pyramid, to be really honest, because it sets a really good message through, especially nowadays where data science, AI, ML, all these fancy hype are happening. Previously, also data science, you can bundle them all up here. Since I've spent most of my years on this part of the pyramid here, solutioning, creating data warehouses, business intelligence, cubes, pivots, whatever it might be. As soon as I went more of developing the bottom part, which I've done at GE and then Siemens and now also in a semiconductor company, you realize actually how much your top of the pyramid can scale better. Your data science can perform better if you have better data quality. If you have a proper architecture in place, it will help you with all of the other things. Data security can flow much easier if you just have a much more proper method of dealing with metadata. And if you have proper ownership, the data governance policies defined, all of these things are the bottom of the pyramid. They're absolutely critical. Anytime I start particularly a data program in the companies that I started with, these are actually really the first few points that I start to make sure that the first year or two that we have these things in place. If you're in a data program that are missing these points, I think not only for the exam, familiarize yourself with the chapter, familiarize yourself with literature, because these are going to be absolutely critical in the next coming years. It has been already for the past couple of years, but I think with the AI Act and all of these things coming in, the bottom of the pyramid will definitely be crucial. 
data architecture and data modeling. So data architecture is quite close to me, to be really honest, because it's actually the task that I love to perform the most. I'm in that mode right now as I am currently starting in a different company as well. Data architecture is trying to describe your existing state. It will go into defining requirements and guiding you on data integration and how to control your data assets better. But if you think about it, data architecture has always been my landscape. When you come into a company or if you want to analyze how your company looks like, the data architecture helps give a lay of the land. Let's put it this way. Architecture wise, the word also originated from architecture, like structural architecture. It's really good also for you to have an overview of your whole building or household to be able to see how each of the rooms function with each other. What does this room need as an input? Does this need air conditioning? But to have that lay of the land, to have that bird's eye view of the landscape is quite important to begin with so that you can really identify, okay, here are the critical areas for the company where there might be certain gaps. As you build up the data architecture, you'll be coming up with information flows, data flows guided by the process that you have in the company. And then slowly you will find certain things where you say like, okay, between this particular function in finance and this particular function in procurement could be some optimization in certain integration points. Does it make sense? Any questions so far? How do you get this bird's eye view if you don't have a good set of data artifacts to start with? So the most basic thing that I always try to connect with is always process because processes and data are, I wouldn't say siblings, but close cousins. As you build up your process and most companies already have it well documented, you have your process of how do you deal with invoices coming in? What are the important criteria on an invoice that needs to be worked on? And then you build that up. So usually my reference point is always process documentation or process architecture process architecture, if you have it, or any process mapping tools that you already have in a company, take that as the beginning point. And then what I do is that I take that and really go into an assessment mode with that particular function. I connect with somebody in that department in finance and try to go through that process itself. From there, you do get a feel what are the most critical sometimes systems that they need, what are the critical data elements that they're relying on to make certain decisions in that particular function. Slowly, you will get a good feel if you're coming from process. That's always my method that have worked the best for myself. Architecture and modeling, I always find it hard to find where the fine line really here is. But once you decide to do a data architecture and you go into data modeling, DEMA says three conceptual, logical, physical, which is generally, right, as you will look for more reference, mostly there will be like four points here. If you're focused on the CDMP exam, they're guiding on three technical levels. You're coming from conceptual levels. So just think about it. This is very high level of just saying finance as a domain has accounts receivable, accounts payable, general ledger as very high level conceptual domains and entities and how they relate to each other. Then one level after the other, you're going one level deeper. And then you have a couple of accounts receivable tables, then some of their critical fields. And then physical will then be really defining how it really looks like in the system. What are the system column names for those attributes and which tables in a particular system from if it's SAP, if it's Oracle, if it's somewhere else, how are these tables linked to each other? That's coming from very high level conceptual and you want to get more defined as you go down. And that's coming from conceptual down to logical and then physical. Naina, you had something. Question. You just touched on the conceptual model. Conceptual model is when the very foundation basic model where you're identifying what is going to be needed between the two systems. And on the left also, you're writing defined data requirements. I want to understand at the architecture level, when you're defining data requirements without using these models on the right, how does the data requirements at the data architecture level look like? Give me an example if you can. So different things. One particular thing that I just wanted to mention. Conceptual model is for me, honestly, less of system biased or oriented. So it's system agnostic. It's not the conceptual level. We're thinking more of the function. Think about it not as a conceptual level on how two systems integrate with each other, but think about what are the important functions in the company that need to work with each other properly. One of the data requirements, for example, right now, I'm currently in the sustainability area. So my function is sustainability. And of course, one thing that's very relevant around it is that it needs data from different parts of the company. Logistics from our transport company, we need to have CO2 emissions from our plants, from our manufacturing sites. We need to have travel information from HR of how many people are 
traveling. So we have so many data points that need to connect. One of the data requirements that is hitting me, how do we create a data platform where all this data is collected harmoniously in a particular well-integrated way? environmental EHS folks, or even the people who have to do non-financial reporting will have a source of truth for that data. If you had in a company already conceptual model where you would already know from what data points are coming from where, it would be easier to map and say, okay, I need to go either from conceptual logical and say, I need to go to this table for this attribute if you want to get how many people have traveled this year or this month. Without that view, you're asking your data practitioners to almost have to do that every time or on a case-to-case -case basis. So then they will have to track. Then they will go from one table to another or do a lineage from this particular model or for this particular view, where does all this data come from? Then you have to do that all manually. And then it will be very one-off for that particular solution. You as a data practitioner coming in, it would be good for you to already set this up set up a data architecture, even if it's just in your small area, so that this artifact can be used over time by different people in the company. It's just simply to describe the, the current architecture or where your company is going with investing new technologies, but it's also helping people who are doing solutioning. So data scientists would then see a good lineage or a good model that they can rely on and say, okay, if I'm using this column, it actually comes from these particular tables based on the physical data model that Raina provided or mapped out. Mapping this out has a big potential in a company. And what I would like to add, if you map this out for your company and you make that as a standard, people will always refer to one common data model for it. So nobody will try to reinvent, because this is what has happened over the years, that people try to create data models one-off for their solution. And then later on, the results of those do not match up because it's so unstandardized. Maybe somebody used different source systems for their data, different from another person's model. And as soon as these data models were just one-offs and created just for that solution, of course, sometimes there will always be some friction and there will always be some inconsistencies. We as data governance practitioners, if we create a standard model and we tell everybody, okay, guys, this is now defined as a standard model. We have checked this with the business, with the functional knowledge. They have signed off that this is indeed a model that we can rely on and all the columns are now standardized. Countries are now in a two-character form and not in different forms. Currency is always USD. If we create this very standard model there and signed off from the business, then everybody will rely on it. If you're creating an AI solution, use this as a standard model for finance or for, let's say, accounts receivable. And if you're doing a report and you want to report to a management, make sure that you report from the standard model. That's where I think doing this in the background, mapping this and having this standardized will really bring its advantage where you feel that everybody is working on more standard definitions of the data. Thought so far? Do you have something more for the CDMP exam? Just come off mm -hmm. mute. Yes and no. Two character and country decision. Is it a modeling decision or an architectural decision? Well, to be really honest, sometimes I see these two functions very close to each other anyway. I think it will fall more into data modeling than architecture. Data architecture, I've always felt it's more conceptual level. Data modeling is getting more specific into really defining these definitions on the tables and policies and standards there. I think both come in hand to hand. I don't think you can exist without the other anyway. So can we say that architecture would be drafting up the current situation or the situation of the organization? Then modeling would be executing what the architecture has said that the processes would be like. So I do it this way. Let's go back to the analogy there or the metaphor with the building. I'd say a data architect or a building architect would set the lay of the land. How big a room should be? Where should the pipes go through? You have that big overview. You see the particular, think about the rooms as different functions. You have a room for finance. You have a room for HR, for procurement. So you have all these room functions. Data architecture will define the functions. Data modeling would go deeper and say, okay, what does this room really need? What does this function really need? It needs to have input. If it's a room where there's no water required, but there's heating required, there's air conditioning required. So it goes into more modeling for that particular function deeper. Then you go into more designing that particular room or that particular function more in depth. But then architecture, I've always seen it as having a blueprint of how everything will function well with each other, because you need to make sure that there is somebody taking a watch over it from a bird's eye view. Or else maybe you cannot move from one room to another or airflow will not work from one room to another and not enough windows. 
This goes into data as well. I'm just saying it from a building perspective. If you don't take this bird's eye view, maybe this data isn't available for consumption from the other function because there's no integration point. There's no point where these two systems integrate with each other. If you have a different view, feel free to come off mute. And if you understood the point differently, feel free to raise it. Yeah, understood. Okay, we'll go through some other points from the Dembok. What is the data architect's responsibility? Data architect makes sure that the data standards are consistent within the company. A data modeler for finance makes sure that they also have the right standards that you're putting in place, that they follow it as well. It has to be a close connection as well with the business. That's one thing that's always important. You don't want to put data standards that doesn't actually function for the business. So that they will eventually do a workaround. Let's say we take that example again with country. You decide as a data architect to make it into a two character and it doesn't work for finance because the reports will always be in the full name of the country. So try to make sure that the standards that you also create are also going to be business relevant. So you try to make sure that their business strategy is to make our non-financial reports more automated and always have that data also available for audits. In the future, if somebody comes in and audits us on our CO2 emissions and so forth. So you as a data architect will need to make sure that is technically sound from a technical perspective, that you have looked at the business strategy and make sure that you're enabling that to happen. If I just say, for example, make sure that your systems have the proper logs and have the proper security in place. As a data architect, we create and maintain organizational knowledge about the data and the systems. This is an interesting point here, because if you look at what a data model is supposed to be, especially if you go to the level of creating more knowledge graphs or ontologies for your data modeling, that's more advanced, but it's there at the end of the day is knowledge presented in technical form. And you as a data architect need to make sure that is up to date and that it's maintained over the years. You don't want that institutional knowledge to just remain with one particular person. There's always risk to it. As soon as you represent what he has in his mind of how an invoice flows within the company, for example, if you represent that also in an information flow, in a knowledge graph, in a data model, you're giving the company something that they can rely on beyond just the person's mind. I've always seen it as knowledge represented in a technical form. You identify opportunities for data usage, cost reduction, risk mitigation. As soon as you have that bird's eye view of your data architecture, slowly you can see where is data duplicated, where do you see redundancies of integration, where can you do certain costs, where do you have even risks, where one of your data points goes outside the company or you're taking external information. That's really what the data architecture also helps provide. It gives you really a good overview and also where your priorities could lie and where your skills are needed. Implements and enforces semantics via common business vocabulary. One of the things also that over the years is quite important to also implement as data governance practitioners or data management practitioners is coming up with a data catalog, standard definitions of what you call an entity. Because as you data model, you will eventually find a certain conflict in definitions. A typical example is that if you define customer from which functions point of view, are you defining customer in? And if you decide to create a data model for customer, you make sure that you take all points of view in or you create different data models because sales looks at customer from a different point of view. Either they can say I'm a marketing customer, a potential customer or an ex-customer. Sales would look at it from different things because they're trying to make money for the company. So even if that customer hasn't purchased anything, he could be a potential customer. So that's sales. Finance looks at it from a totally different view. Finance just wants to charge. So they define customer of the entities that they can charge the invoices. So that's a different definition of customer. And maybe there's different names. Even if Google is your customer from a sales perspective and you want to put it in your marketing materials that Google is your customer, finance sees it differently because it's the legal entity that pays the bill. It's not Google and instead Alphabet. Now that you find these conflicts, you as a data architect also need to make sure that you take these new definitions in create a data catalog where you do have a repository for this common business vocabulary and then also make sure that you have differentiators between those definitions. Because again, you create a model around customer and somebody takes that model, uses it for marketing and they realize that it was a totally wrong definition of customer what they needed. So make sure that you have that metadata management behind it, that you're managing that those definitions so that people know what they're actually working with once they deal with your data model. 
I just wanted to say first that I think it's really awesome how the different knowledge areas of the Diembach and the aspects of the Aiken Pyramid are really all intertwined. So as you mentioned, metadata is so important for understanding which viewpoint that you're representing. The customer example is a classic one. It's a really good way to think about how there is different versions of the truth for different departments, different ways of looking at the same entity. And it's not like going to really be possible to have one concrete definition for the entire enterprise. So it's valuable then to think about things from different perspectives. And that's a very valid way to go about the data architecture process. So thank you very much for bringing that nuance forward out of the book. Nina, I don't know if you want to come off mute again and ask your question. So it's just a simple question that when you integrate your data to external source, you're getting in SaaS applications and whatnot, mm -hmm. for example, what some of those challenges from architecture point of view? I come from the modeling area, that's a different situation, but from the architecture point of view, what are some of the challenges that you might have faced? Different ones as well. The things that mainly come to mind sometimes is, first of all, the integration point. So if you are, let's say, non-cloud, you've seen that a lot of companies are still afraid of cloud solutions and you need to integrate with an external partner and you need to connect with them on-prem. Those are things that come up often, firewalls and so forth you definitely have to deal with. One thing that I constantly also see as a very important point, which let's say a younger version of me would have not worried about it too much because we just want to create the integration points. It's security and, and data integrity as well is quite important. So from a data architect, I also want to make sure that we have the right security in place of ensuring that the data coming through the pipeline into our intranet, into the company is secured. You definitely have to talk with your cybersecurity teams as well of what are the policies or what are the things that you have to consider and put in place as a data architect for making that integration point happen. What are the things that you need from that external company or that external data source? What are the current certifications that you need from them to make sure that integration is secured enough for you to establish for your company? Which something prior for me taking on data architecture, I would not have considered. For me, I just want to implement and I'll just make the connection to get their connection details, open up a firewall from our side and try to make that happen. But we as data architects, we have to take a little step back, look at the bigger picture and see what the bigger risks are for your company. Yeah. Not just of the requirement of making that integration up, but think about it in a bigger picture. The Aaron question is the data catalog and the business clause are the same. Yeah, I'm not sure if the inbox says something differently, but from my view, it is most of the time, honestly, from a data catalog. I actually try to go into a function and ask finance if they already have a business glossary available that I can load into the data catalog and make it more available for the company. That's actually what I usually do even. So I don't see a big difference between business glossary or data catalog. Maybe the catalog can go deeper. That's one thing. What the data catalog does is takes your business definitions. So let's say we go back to customer, we say customer, and then we usually have your business glossary where it's just the definition. Then the data catalog, what it enables, it then also translates, what does that customer actually mean technically? Then it says, okay, technically customer is available then in SAP, in Salesforce. And then it was like, okay, why three different systems? And then it would describe even further. If you're looking for a customer in AP, then use this field in SAP. If you're looking at a customer in EMA, then it's this field in Salesforce. These are how these tables are linked together. They belong to one common data model, which is called the customer data model. If you would like to remove the noise sense of going to those systems and checking the data there, use the data model here. It's available on Snowflake. That's where the data catalog becomes something more than just a business glossary, but the business glossary is always my foundational base for it. Yeah. Just trying to understand your question there, Mohamed. Hi, Mark. The question is, should we map the data from various systems into a standard model or any standard like in the science or the data warehouse and dashboard in the organization? So we may convert it first into the standard model, or we just use the raw data or the SS data from the system. I see what you're saying. If I understood it right, I've seen it happen in different ways. So if, for example, the company is dominantly oriented into one particular technology, then I would say, yes, you can use it as your standard model. For example, let's say SAP, and you have the concept of business partner. You're saying, can I ingest the table from SAP as is to your data lake and use that as your standard model rather than creating a standard model on top of it? I would say yes, if you are predominantly linked to one particular system. The problem will come in if you have variety. So especially, for example, you have both Oracle and SAP at the same time. 
And now you need to create a data model that is not specific to SAP and not specific to Oracle anymore. That's where your data model definition would come in. So then instead of saying, do you have a table or your model would say customer, then map it. Then what is it called in the as is table from SAP? What is it called in the as is table from Oracle or any other subsystems and or whatever systems, then you do that mapping. But I would say you could use as is if you feel that is the predominantly standard that the company is already trying to go for, then I would say yes, because then it matches. But then if it's not, then you have to think of how you can get creative on creating a standard model that is more system agnostic than the others. Yeah. I hope I understood that question. Who's responsible to create the glossary? This is a good question there, Rose, because there are two things there. Officially, you would like as much of these things to be on the business as much as you can. Mainly because if you create a business glossary or a data catalog and it's super defined, well-structured, a lot of knowledge in there. But if the business doesn't use it, it's just going to collect dust on a technology <laughs> shelf. You would want that responsibility to create, maintain that to be a good partnership. The main challenge that I constantly see in creating data catalogs is that you as technologists need to do it as a pilot. I wouldn't say spoon feed, but you would need to guide them more in the first few phases. We as technologists know deeper of how the data catalog should look like, how it should be structured. Just imagine it's somebody new coming into our world. There will always be a phase where you have to guide them for the first few phases in the pilot, in the POC, for them to adapt the data catalog. But as soon as the click happens, there will be a time where they would realize, oh, okay, so I can use the data catalog for this. And now I don't have to go find the table in this system of what is called. I don't have to contact my BI expert just to know what this table actually means or what this column actually means. I can now use the data catalog for that knowledge. As soon as that click happens and the buy-in comes in, then it will be much more easier flow. But I think that the first few phases will always be difficult. But if it's a responsibility, I would say it will always be the responsibility. Almost anything in data governance and data management will always be a good partnership between you as a data practitioner and the business. The power comes from that partnership. Only they in the business can really articulate what the value of it is in the company. How much time does it save? If the definitions are more available publicly, if the tables are more available publicly, if everything is described much more easier publicly in the company data catalog, how much time does it save for that department? You could really map it down where people used to ask this question and would get their answers back in hours. And now they can find that information in a Google-like environment from the data catalog within seconds or within minutes. I was just going to ask, could yeah, you yeah. help us understand what you think might be the most important topics from this concept for the exam? The most important concept for this exam, I would say maybe value of data architecture. Why is it required? And it's always a very hard point sometimes to make. But again, I would just always go back to the architecture from a building perspective. There is an importance to have a blueprint. If you have done maintenance in your own home, the challenges that go into it, Think about how much of a value it has to have a blueprint of where your pipelines are, where does the electricity flow from one point to another, where are sockets where you can actually integrate. So I'm trying to mix the two worlds there with data architecture and also building architecture, but the same thing. To have a blueprint, there's a big value for you to fully understand what are all the functions available, what are all their needs, and how does information or electricity or water flow in that particular building. That's valuable information because as you go and try to determine where are your gaps, where are your risk exposures in the company, the blueprint will be the guide on how you can identify and deal with these issues. And without it, you're shooting in the dark there to be solving one issue here, but there might be a bigger issue and a bigger play that you could actually work on where it would make more value to the company. Defining enterprise standards is absolutely critical. Managing the life cycle of data. It goes into also how much data are you allowed to retain in the company? What should you archive? Can you reduce cost if you start archiving data from last year that is not actually needed? That all goes into the responsibility of data architecture. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Any more questions? Last minute question huh? about data architecture or the nature of life and the universe. Don't go <laughs> shooting in the dark. That's the <laughs> key takeaway from the last section. <laughs> A couple of points for the exam for the CDMP, if you are thinking of considering it. My best advice is that go purchase the exam. That really drives a big commitment. If you already made that purchase and you put money out from your pocket, that drive at least drove me to finally take the exam as soon as I purchased it. 
The purchasing also comes along with the practice questions, which are also very, very helpful for you to prepare for the exam. The practice questions are a bank of 200 questions, but the application where you will do your practice exams will be 40 questions each round. So you can do that unlimited. So go ahead and do that. If you're thinking about the exam, get committed by purchasing it and then coming to the study groups and preparing for it. And then practice exams are also going to be absolutely key. And then what's also really good, Dama has different chapters in different cities. Link up to your Dama chapter, see if it exists. There are local events from your Dama chapters that you should also try to link up to. Just look up the Dama website and see the chapters that exist. Thanks everybody for joining today. It was a lovely discussion and hopefully you'll join the next one as well, the next chapter. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks everyone coming. It's so nice to see such a big group today. This is really awesome. Thanks, Mark. Take care, everyone. Bye.